So this is a presentation that I've been thinking about for some time. Um, as I consider the content uh, for a newer rescuer to special operations, they may think or go through this, uh, this presentation and watch the video. And uh, my hope for them is that uh, they realize that of all the rules that they're taught, of all of the um, techniques that, uh, that we have in our curriculums, that there are reasons why those rules exist and uh, that there's a why behind the how. Um, for the rescuers that have been around a while, uh, that uh, have been in the special operations game, uh, I believe that we should always be continuing to grow. And so I hope for the guys that have been around a while that uh, maybe this uh, this spurs you on a little bit and uh, uh, continues to allow growth in your knowledge and skill set and uh, and continue to work and and grow that. So I've titled this the mystique of right triangles and rescue. And uh, as you uh, as you do rescue, you're going to see triangles all over the place. And uh, interesting is is you get used to seeing them and uh, you identify where they are, you can use those right triangles to identify all sorts of things. And uh, the, if you understand that aspect of the triangles, uh, then uh, it can increase the efficiency of your operation. If not, then you may just recognize it, but not identify the significance of it. And there's some mystique behind that. And I, I call this a primer to understanding them because it, it, it's going to fall way short of a complete school on uh, the depths of triangles and right triangles. But uh, I at least want to uh, cover some of the content and uh, get, get everybody started down the road uh, so that uh, you understand uh, the benefits of, of right triangles. So as uh, you think about triangles as a whole, uh, they're often thought of by their sides. And so you have the three types of triangles if you're considering by side. Uh, but then you also have uh, triangles named by their angles. And the one that we'll focus primarily on will be the right triangle and uh, the advantages of uh, the right triangle and how we can use them. So uh, <laughs> we see them everywhere in rescue. And uh, uh, we're going to look, uh, we'll first talk about some of the principles and premises and uh, lay a good foundation. And uh, once we have that, then we're going to look at five instances in different disciplines where these right triangles show up and how we can use uh, an understanding of right triangles uh, to understand what's happening uh, within uh, that discipline. So, uh, Right triangle trigonometry is a subset of trigonometry, and um, as you dive into that subject, uh, you'll learn that uh, with a, a right triangle, all you need are two knowns to solve all of the other unknowns of a triangle. That could be uh, two lengths of a side, or two lengths of sides of the triangle, or it may be one side length and one angle. Uh, but with those two nodes, you can solve the rest of the, the triangle, be it their angles, the links, or the magnitudes of the different sides. Uh, and that can be very advantageous to us as rescuers to be able to identify uh, strut links, force uh, multiplications, uh, uh, speed, all sorts of different things. Uh, you can use trig to quickly determine magnitudes of different legs. Uh, you can use it to develop rules of thumb or factors, and uh, we'll cover an example of that. Uh, and uh, if you understand it deep enough, you can really just throw the math out the window and understand that uh, the length of a leg is just a magnitude, and you can compare that length uh, to the other sides and uh, determine the quantity of those other sides. So as we talk about triangles and right triangles, um, you'll hear me often refer to components. And uh, we'll be discussing triangles in two dimensions, and you might think of that as the x and y axis. Uh, with a, a two-dimensional vector, uh, there will be two vector components. Uh, 
And so uh, of the three legs in the triangle, one leg will be the originating vector. And the other two legs, or sides, I should say, of the triangle will be its component vectors. And uh, you can use uh, uh, trig, you can use uh, vector analysis to be able to quantify the magnitude of the other component or vector components uh, based off of known quantities. So let's address the term magnitude. Magnitude generally refers to a distance or a quantity. And so a couple of examples of that are weight, length, and speed. Uh, weight and length are the two that we, we think of and use the most, but speed's also in there. And we'll have one example of what, not necessarily speed, we'll be using velocity, but uh, speed is a magnitude. And so if we look at our example triangle, uh, we have a 45 degree right triangle. Uh, the blue side on the left has a magnitude of one. And if you uh, look at the red side, it also has a magnitude of one. And the pink side has a magnitude of 1.41. Now let's talk about the term vector. So a vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Uh, so, uh, and as you're drawing a vector, uh, the length of the line signifies its magnitude or symbolizes its magnitude, where the uh, direction of the arrow indicates the, the direction of that magnitude or of that vector. And so we can see in the, uh, the example uh, here is that uh, if the blue line on the left is our originating vector, then it applies a downward vector uh, at a magnitude of the length of the blue line, which we've uh, decided is one. Uh, and if we look at the red arrow, we can see that uh, it has a, a component vector that uh, moves from left to right at uh, whatever the magnitude is of the length of that. And then the same for the uh, pink side of the triangle there. Uh, it's moving in a uh, downward and rightward direction because of the arrow signifies that. So uh, not even worrying about math, we can eyeball uh, many of these vectors and component vectors. And uh, when you do that, it's often called a vector analysis. Uh, so the example that we have here is our 45 degree right triangle and you'll find 45 degree right triangles everywhere in particular in structural collapse and uh, heavy vehicle stabilization. Um, but uh, you'll see that, that 45 degree right triangle in a lot of, lot of places. So here uh, we'll say that our blue vector on the, that is the left side of the triangle is our originating vector. And so we're gonna compare the magnitude of that to our other two vector components, be it being the, the purple or the pink side and the red side. And the, the magnitude of those comparisons gives us the magnitude of that component vector. So with a 45 degree uh, right triangle, the, the red component vector on the bottom has an equal magnitude to the blue vector. And you can see that graphically represented by the length of the blue, blue vector compared to the red vector. They're equal, so red is one and blue is one. The pink vector is longer than the blue vector. Well, but by how much? Well, we can take a blue vector, put it alongside the pink vector, take another one, stack it on top of it, and we can do a comparison of the pink vector to the blue. And you can see here that uh, we have about uh, a 1.4 um, magnitude uh, of blue vector line, uh, blue vectors compared to the pink. Uh, so the pink side of that triangle has a 1.4 uh, magnitude uh, of the blue vector, and the red is equal, it's one to one. And you can eyeball that, you don't even need math. So I want you to think of this in, a, in, in two different ways. Uh, magnitude can be, uh, we've already uh, said, can be several things. But the two that, 
most commonly get used in rescue are length and force. And so I want you to think of those vector quantities or magnitudes of this 45 degree uh, tri right triangle uh, in length and force. So if you think of it in, as in length, um, then the blue side of the triangle, if it were 10 feet, then the pink side of the triangle would be 14 feet. And uh, if you think of it is a matter of force, and you said, okay, the blue side of the triangle represents 10,000 pounds, then the pink side of the triangle would represent 14,000 pounds. So again, without doing any math, we can eyeball that and come up with a pretty decent estimation of what the magnitudes of different sides of this triangle are uh, based on identifying the uh, originating vector and comparing it to the other components uh, to identify the magnitude of those components. But if you take it a step further, you can use math to be precise. Uh, and, it, and it's a good practice that, uh, you know, as you're considering making a rule for something or you're considering uh, uh, identifying how accurate your guesstimation was or your vector analysis was, uh, you can use math to, to determine that. And so here we're using uh, sine, cosine, tangent. Sometimes people call that SOHCAHTOA. Um, and we are running the math to identify what the magnitudes of these different uh, vectors are. And so again, we're going to say that the blue vector is our originating vector, and we want to know uh, what the magnitude of the pink vector is. And so if you use the, the sine function to determine that, uh, you can determine that the resultant of the pink side or the magnitude of that pink vector is 1.41, which is the same magnitude that we got with our vector analysis or our eyeballing it. And then same for the red. Uh, you run the math on it and uh, you find out that uh, the red side is equal to the blue side. And uh, as, a, as a general rule, Knowing those numbers about a 45 degree right triangle uh, would be a very good thing for a rescuer to just memorize. So let's do one more vector analysis. Now let's look at a 60 degree right triangle. Uh, we often put our stabilization or lifting struts at 60 degrees. We put rakers at 60 degrees. So it's a, another common angle that we see in, in rescue work. So if uh, we look at this and we just eyeball it, we take our originating blue vector, we compare that to the red vector on the bottom, it's a little more than half, uh, it's right around 0.6 uh, of the blue vector, and so it's 60%, or it's uh, 0.6 of the blue vector. Uh, and then if we look at our pink side of our triangle, uh, we can just guesstimate and look at it and estimate that it's about 1.2 times the blue vector. So again, no math needed. But if we want to bring the precision in, we can see how accurate was our estimations. Well, if you run the math on the uh, pink side of the triangle, the long side of the triangle, which is called the hypotenuse, uh, we, uh, the precise number is 1.15. Well, that rounded to the nearest uh, tenth is 1.2, which is what we guesstimated. And if we uh, look at our red side of our triangle, uh, we run the math on that, we come out with uh, 0 0.57, again, around that to 0 0.6. So our estimation, just by eyeballing it, we're very, very close to the mathematical precision technique. So let's look at some examples of where we see these triangles and where uh, we can use it and to understand rescue work better. Uh, so the first one, and we're not going to dive real deep into it, but uh, we'll talk about the pendulum effect uh, uh, in water rescue when you pitch a throw bag out to somebody in the water uh, and you want to pendulum them to shore. So depending on how far in the pendulum they are, uh, kind of identifies how fast they're going to pendulum to the shore. Uh, you can see on the right side, if, uh, if the rope goes uh, 90 degrees to the water, uh, the 
Uh, water is putting downward pressure on the body, but there is no um, vector that is applying a, a force to the left. Uh, same thing at zero degrees. So if uh, your uh, belayer is directly in line with the flow of water, you're not going to get a uh, vector either left or right to pendulum the person to shore. So we'll focus in here on the 45 and 20 degree angles just to arbor arbitrarily pick those two. And you may think back to when you've grabbed a throw bag and you've begun to pendulum to shore, how in the initial moments of that pendulum, how you're moving pretty quick, but the closer you get to shore, you start moving slower. Well, there's a reason for that. So if we look at uh, the yellow triangles, the right triangles that we've drawn uh, over the um, our, our examples here, the dotted blue line represents the velocity of water. And uh, speaking about magnitude, uh, as we're talking about this pendulum effect in swift water, uh, velocity is the magnitude, which uh, is, is the quantity of the magnitude, or I should say, is the value uh, of the magnitude or the unit. So uh, if we look at the and zero in on the 45 degree uh, angle of our pendulum on the left, uh, you can think back to the triangle that we had before where the two sides that are not the hypotenuse of a 45 degree triangle equal each other. So we automatically know that with a 45 degree angle, that the speed at which we will pendulum to shore equals the velocity of water. So let's look at uh, the 20 degree angle here. So with the 20 degree angle, uh, we can just think of it and from the perspective of a vector analysis, and we could just compare the blue vector or the blue velocity of the water to the red. And we automatically can see that it's significantly shorter, which means that it's going to be significantly less velocity. And it's just slightly less than half. And if you were to run the math, it would be 0 0.36. So that is the magnitude of the velocity uh, pushing you to the shore. So uh, we can think of being pendulum to shore as there being kind of two mo very significant effects that allow us uh, to move to shore. Uh, first being that of the velocity and the angle of the rope, uh, uh, which keeps you static in the water and would create this red vector component that you see in these diagrams. And the second would be the laminar flow of water. The, the laminar flow tells us that uh, in the center of the river, the water flows faster. And as uh, you move to the shore, uh, the water is flowing slower. And so uh, that will also cause or have an effect on the speed at which you're going to move uh, uh, with this pendulum effect. Uh, but uh, strictly talking about the right triangles, uh, you can see that at 45 degrees, the speed or the velocity at which uh, you pendulum to shore equals that of the flow of the water, and at 20 degrees, it's significantly less. So now let's look uh, at a couple of structural collapse examples. Uh, the first one we'll hit is the 3, 4, 5 rule to make something square. Well, how does that work? Well, it works because of the principles of right triangles. Um, and so with right triangles, you can use the Pythagorean, and theor Pythagorean and theor theorem, and you can uh, do your a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Well, the a is one side of the triangle, the b is the other side of the triangle, and the c is the hypotenuse. And so uh, if you were to run the Pythagorean theor theorem on the three, four, uh, magnitudes of those two sides of the triangle, you would get five as the answer for the for the hypotenuse. And so uh, that tells us that uh, with uh, uh, three running down one side of the triangle, four running down at a right angle, uh, 
down the other side of the triangle that our hypotenuse needs to be five. And so we can use that to make our raker square. Uh, we can use that to uh, just make sure that things are square over a long distance where our speed square or framing square really can't help us as much. Uh, just as a, an interesting note, uh, there are infinite numbers of these instances where you have whole numbers uh, that equal the sides uh, of a right triangle. And uh, when those sides of the right triangles are whole numbers, they're called Pythagorean triples. So let's talk about uh, another example of a place where in structural collapse you see a right triangle, and that's a raker. And we're going to identify two triangular things about a raker uh, that uh, you can use these principles of a right triangle uh, to our advantage. Uh, the first one are going to be those raker multipliers, where if you have a 45 degree raker, uh, you use the factor of 17 and a 60, you use the factor of 14 to identify your raker length. Uh, and then the second one will be uh, the moment force on a raker, and we want to quantify the magnitude of the force that our raker has to support or that it's capable of supporting. So let's, uh, let's look at our 45 degree raker uh, multiplier. So the rule that's in the SOG uh, tells us that if we measure our insertion point in feet and we multiply that by 17, that that will give us the raker length in inches. Well, how can that be? Why does that work? Well, it works because of the principles of a right triangle. So if we know that our raker angle is at 45, we can use our uh, trig function of sine uh, to work the math comparing the opposite angle or the opposite side, which is our insertion point side length to the raker length. Well, we, we are converting feet on the insertion height to inches on the raker length. So on our insertion point side, we're going to give that a magnitude of 12 because 12 e inches equal one foot. And so if we run that math out, we learn that uh, using uh, the unit of 12 for our insertion point height, um, that uh, our raker length or magnitude is 17. Well, that's where we get, uh, or it's 16.97, but for round math and for field use, 17 works. And so that's how the multiplier of 17 allows us to convert the insertion point at, high, at a height in feet to a raker length in inches. Same principle applies for your 60 degree raker. It's just that when you run the math, you have to have a different value for sine. Uh, but the same principle applies. You run the math out at 60 degrees instead of 45, and you end up with a, a raker length that's 13.86 for an insertion point at 12. And so that gets rounded to 14 for field math. We're not building cabinets, as many people often say, in structural collapse. And so we use the number 14 to convert that insertion point height in feet to a raker length in inches. All right, the second triangular instance, which we'll review for a raker, is that of what's called a moment force. So what does that mean? Well, we're placing a raker in structural collapse to prevent a wall from tipping over. And that tipping, or maybe a more precise engineering way to say it, or its tendency to want to rotate about the point at the ground is called a moment. And uh, we use the term moment uh, because that's the most appropriate engineering term for it. Uh, you could call it torque, but torque is often thought of in the applications of something that actually rotates or about a point. Where moments, we're typically trying to keep that moment force from moving at all. And so that's the point of a raker is to keep the wall from moving at all. And so, we want to think about the, or the tipping 
of that wall or the rotation about its connection point to the ground. Uh, we want to prevent that moment force from uh, being able to move and create a kinetic energy. And so uh, we, if we look at our triangle there on the right, or our diagram on the right, uh, you can see the, the brown wall there. It's got a hinge at the bottom, which is signifying or uh, you know, simulating its connection to the ground. And uh, you have a, uh, an assertion point at a height uh, where you can see I have the red moment uh, vector coming off of the wall. And uh, it applies a moment vector perpendicular to the wall. Well, we want to prevent that, uh, that moment force from, from being able to move. And so uh, the most ideal way to do that would be to apply an, an immediately opposing moment force from a horizontal plane uh, parallel with the original moment force that would oppose that. That would be the most optimal way to oppose it. Unfortunately, we rarely find the opportunity to oppose that moment directly in line with it. Uh, a couple of places where you can do that is in trench rescue. Uh, our struts are parallel or uh, are in line with that moment force or in a very narrow alleyway where maybe we shore a, an unstable building to the adjacent building. Uh, instead of building a raker, uh, you would build a, a, a horizontal shore, which would be uh, uh, more similar to a, 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 trench, uh, a trench shore. So instead, uh, since we can't oppose that moment force horizontally, we're going to oppose it at an angle. And that angle is our is our raker. And so if we look at our yellow triangle in our image and our in our diagram, uh, that yellow triangle is our the right triangle that we're looking for. And so we have our moment force, our uh, moment vector coming off of the wall perpendicular from it. But we're going to support that moment force with a raker at an angle. And the two most common raker angles we use are 45s and 60s. There's also this vertical component of that moment force, and that's the amount of force that that raker is driving into the ground. And so whatever your substrate is below the raker, uh, you want to make sure that that's, that's substantial. Because in a 45 degree raker, that vertical component matches the moment of the wall. Uh, at the same time, uh, we might think of it from the perspective of when that raker uh, touches the cleat on the sole of this uh, solid sole raker in our example, uh, it's putting a horizontal force on the cleat. And that horizontal force uh, equals the moment force. All right, well, let's, uh, let's zero in here on our, on our, on our raker. Um, we can immediate, and, and uh, I will say that uh, as we talk about rakers, uh, the, the unit of magnitude that we will be discussing as a vector quantity is force. And so we want to control the forces. So if we think about, uh, and, and we just eyeball this thing, uh, we, we just, we're going to think of it from a, a vector analysis instead of a mathematical analysis. Uh, we can just immediately identify that that pink side or the hypotenuse of that triangle, which is the raker, um, is longer than the, the red side of that triangle, which is the moment force that we're trying to control uh, from the wall. And so with that being the case, uh, we automatically know that that raker has to support more force than that moment force is going to create. And that's the case in, in almost all load supporting applications, is that uh, you oftentimes have to support it at an angle. And when we do support something at an angle, then we are going to see more force generated on whatever that supporting mechanism is. And in this case, it's a, uh, it's a raker leg uh, to control whatever that force is. So we can just eyeball that. We can look at it. 
uh, and we can look at it right here and we can we can guesstimate it's it's about 70 percent uh, so that uh, raker uh, is, uh, or we could look at it from the perspective of if the moment is a hundred percent the raker's got to support 1.4 percent or uh, 1.4 times or 140 uh, percent so just uh, eyeballing it right now no math we can identify that about the raker so uh, how strong is a raker and how strong are our four by fours? Well, if we look at uh, the excerpt from the, the FOG, which is the field operations guide for the structural engineers, uh, we can see that uh, they identified the design load for one raker to be 2,500 pounds. All right, so that's, that's handy to know and keep in our back pocket. Um, we, then we can look in the, in the center example and we can say, okay, the design strength of a four by four fo post that's eight foot long is 8,000 pounds. Okay, again, very handy to know, a good strength to keep in the back of your pocket. And then we, but oftentimes we, we know that our raker lengths are going to be 11 to 12 feet long. Well, how strong is the four by four at that length? Well, I found in the uh, four post vertical shore diagram that uh, it gives a value of each four by four post at different heights. And so you can see that at 12 foot or somewhere around 11, 12 feet, you've got a value of about 3,500 pounds. So uh, I would say that uh, Raker is, has a design load of 2,500 pounds. And then our four by fours at the length that we would commonly see a raker set is around 3,500 pounds. And uh, I think Andy Mietzik would want you to remember that if you're gonna have a raker leg that's 11 foot or longer, you need to be sure and put your midpoint braces in. All right, so let's, uh, let's think about this raker moment uh, a little bit deeper here for a second. So if we know that that raker leg has it has the ability to support 3,500 pounds at around 12 feet, we could back that up and we could say, okay, well, if we can support uh, 3,500 pounds with a 12 foot long four by four, how much moment force can that control with a 45 degree raker? Well, uh, we could use our vector analysis and compare that and say, well, it's about 70% of 3,500 pounds. Or we could do the mathematical analysis, which I've done in the top right of the slide, and we come out to the moment equaling uh, just about 2,500 pounds. So if we, again, refer back to the design load of a raker, it's 2,500 pounds. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that those numbers line up. So let's shift gears here to a different discipline, um, heavy lifting. Uh, in this instance, we're talking about heavy lifting of a school bus um, and, uh, and, the using, and using struts to do that. Uh, I pulled this image off of the Paratech website. Uh, so it's, it's their numbers and their diagram. So if we look at the, the, the two sets of struts that are in play, um, You've got the uh, stabilization strut, which creates the blue right triangle. And then you have the yellow green colored triangle that's created by the lifting strut or the hydrofusion strut. So the, the, one of the first things that you need to do whenever you're gonna lift a heavy load is estimate the weight. Where, and then once you've estimated the weight, where is that center of gravity? Well, in this instant with the bus, the assumption is center of gravity is dead center, and we're going to estimate the load at 40,000 pounds, and we're going to say, okay, well, if these struts are set at equal angles on equal level ground and a lot of assumptions that may or may not be true in the real world, uh, then the struts will work equally together to support the load. So we're going to zero in on... Uh, the load, the half of the load on the right side. So as we zero in on this, uh, we can see that we will focus on the hydrofusion strut and the right triangle that's created by that strut. Uh, 
uh, as we're considering the magnitude as it relates to this uh, this setup, uh, we're going to be talking about force. Though a couple of slides from now, uh, we'll talk about how it can also represent length. <clears throat> so let's zero in just a smidge more, take a little bit more clutter out of our diagram. So here we've got uh, really close to what would be called a free body diagram where we've kind of removed the, the, the clutter around so we could focus in on our triangle in question. So the uh, blue side of the triangle represents FR or force on the right side of the bus. <clears throat> so again, we uh, said earlier that we're going to assume that our original load was 40,000 pounds, which I know a bus weighs considerably less than that, but uh, uh, we're going to uh, talk about some reasons why I'm using 40,000 in a few minutes. Uh, so if that bus weighed 40,000 pounds, then half of that would be 20,000 pounds. And so our blue vector is 20,000 pounds. That's the magnitude of it. Well, we could do a vector analysis. We don't have to do any math, and we can uh, compare the blue vector to the quantity or the magnitude of force that the strut or our pink vector, the hypotenuse of this triangle, has to support. And immediately you can identify that the strut has to support more weight than the original force vector because the pink vector arrow is longer than the blue vector arrow. But by how much? Well, eyeballing it, and we've already done a 60 degree angle in a couple of places, um, uh, we, we could figure that out. Well, also oftentimes in, uh, in, when using struts, uh, we need to give some consideration to what that horizontal force is that's applied to the base plate of uh, the, uh, the strut setup. And uh, uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a significant aspect to setting struts up. So let's, uh, let's do a vector analysis, no math needed. Uh, so if we take our blue vector and we compare that to our pink vector, uh, we can estimate that it's about 1.2 times the length. So uh, length is the same as magnitude is the same as force. So we could say, okay, well, uh, if we had 20,000 pounds of force as our original vector, our blue vector, that means the pink vector is 24,000 pounds. Well, immediately that exceeds the uh, rate rating capacity of our hydrofusion strut. So if you weren't thinking about this principle, you might say, okay, well, I got the support 20,000 pounds, cool. My hydrofusion can do that, no problem. When in reality, your hydrofusion is going to have to support 24,000 pounds, which exceeds its rating. Now let's focus in on our horizontal component here. So uh, our horizontal component of this, if we compare our blue vector to our red vector, we can identify that it's about 0.6. It's a little more than half. All right, well, 0.6 of 20,000 is 12,000. So that means that the base plate wants to kick out at a magnitude of 12,000 pounds. Well, how do we control that? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that go into play with that. Uh, one is whatever the restraining mechanism is, whether it's ratchets or chain, or you put pickets in place. Uh, so all three of those are options to try to restrain the base plate at its particular point in, in space. The other factor that's in play is what's called keying, and that's the keying between the base plate and whatever the substrate is, whatever the ground is made of. Uh, and uh, and there's friction, and friction and keying are two different things. Uh, the friction of that aluminum plate on the asphalt of the ground, uh, you could run the math on that and come up with the friction coefficient and identify how much friction is in play. But then you also have the keying, and the keying is the little 
kernels on the bottom of the ba of the those 12 by 12 base plates that are used uh, for most of our vehicle stabilization stuff uh, those stick out so that they interlock with whatever the surface is uh, and it creates a mechanical resistance to that kick out and so um, whatever your straining mechanism is whether it's chains ratchets or pickets the friction and the keying, those three elements all come together to want to resist, in this instance, that 12,000 pounds of horizontal force that's created by a 20,000 pound load supported by a strut at 60 degrees. So we did that vector analysis with no math. We just did a, an easy comparison. Well, let's run the math on it. How close were we? Well, we pull out our scientific calculator and do some Sokotoa and run the run the trig out and we come out to identify that our strut needs to support 20,000 or correction 23,094 well our no math was 24,000 and our math is 23 and change that's pretty close same thing with our horizontal component uh, our math tells us that it's 11,500 our no math said 12,000 those are pretty close and uh, pretty handy for field use. Let's back up one slide. I had something on there I want to highlight. I've got a little sentence here that says you could even do this with a tape measure. So let's let's uh, dive into that for just a second. All right, if I take a tape measure and I measure from the tip of my strut vertically down to the ground, and I'm measuring what we see here in our diagram as our blue vector line we can we'll, we'll come up with a measurement and uh, we could come up with that measurement in in inches and uh let's just say that it's a hundred inches all right well you divide twenty four thousand by a hundred and you end up with uh 240 so for every inch you have 240 pounds well if we then take our tape measure and we measure the length of our strut, we'll come out with a measurement of about 120 inches. And then we could multiply that 240 by the 120, and we would come out with our 24,000 pounds. So uh, again, there's a little bit of math in play with that, but it's not terrible. And we're using that math in that example to determine the magnitude of the force but you can also use it to determine the length of your strut. So if you memorize that a 60 degree angle needs 120% of whatever your vertical component is, well, you measure that out with a tape measure times 1.2, and now you know how long your strut needs to be. So you, if you have a solid understanding of these triangular principles, uh, you can very efficiently start operating. All right, so let's let's talk about one more piece of this that I think is important for heavy vehicle lifting and stabilization. So I, I alluded to as we we talked about in the in the very beginning of this diagram and this this setup uh, that uh, we exceeded the weight rating of our hydrofusion. We also want to think about the ratings of our struts. So. <clears throat> If we know the length of our blue line is whatever it is, and in this case, we're going to say that it's at eight feet, and we put our strut at 60 degrees, well, we could run the math on that and realize that our strut's going to be almost 10 feet. It's, I think it's 9.6 if I remember correctly, but we're going to use 10 for round numbers. And it syncs up with our, our work uh, working load chart. Uh, and it's good for field math. So if I know that, okay, well, uh, the guy that's not paying attention might say, well, I'm going to support this load at eight feet. Look at my load chart at eight feet. My strut's good for 20,000 pounds. I'm supporting 20,000 pounds. Good to go. Well, not so fast. If we think about supporting that load at an angle, our strut has to be longer. In fact, our strut needs to be 10 feet now. So I need to know what my strut is good for at 10 feet, not eight. So if I run down my chart over there, I see that my strut rating at 10 foot is 12,000 pounds. So you're really going to have to pay attention there. So 
Uh, supporting 20,000 pounds at an eight foot insertion height, you can't do it with one strut. You would need two. That's why I'm an advocate of using the four to one safety factor portion of the chart. Uh, most people aren't considering these aspects of uh, what's going on in our in our stabilization. And so I think it's important that we use that four to one safety safety factor side. If you have all the time in the world and you can do the math on it and you come up with a really good estimation and you're thinking about the length of the strut compared to its insertion point height and all of those ratings, then you might could cheat over to the two to one side. Uh, but I still feel better if we make it a generic practice to use that four to one safety factor side. Uh, and I've got several other reasons that are a little beyond the scope of this uh, that have to do with dynamic loading and and uh, and whatnot. Um, uh, but uh, I just think it's a really important uh, it's a good practice to use that four to one safety factor portion of the chart. So the last thing I'll say about struts is that uh, this, you know, running that math. Uh, well ahead of an emergency allows a chart like you see here to get created. And so you can uh, you not worry as much about the mathy stuff in the field and you can just use some generic rule. And you say, okay, you know, at a six degree angle, I know it's about 120% or precisely 115. I know at a 45 degree, it's about 150% or precisely 141. Uh, and what I want you to think about is that those percentages or multipliers aren't just about the force. They're also about length and strut length. And so you can uh, you can use that to your advantage. All right, let's uh, let's give a rope example now uh, and let's uh, mine into a change of direction. Uh, so uh, this was a training uh, at one of our reset classes. And uh, I know there's a little bit of uh, um, skew to this diagram because of the angle of the shot, but uh, it'll work for our, our, our conversation. And so we're going to say that the inside angle of this change of direction is about 60 degrees. Well, so let's, let's take a look at this. Um, we know, or we're going to assume, I should say, uh, given assumption that the tension in the rope is 500 pounds. All right. Well, T1 on one side and T2, both of those are equal. They're both 500 pounds. All pulleys do in a change of direction is change the direction of the force and reduce the friction. And so T1 is 500 pounds. T2 is 500 pounds. So the total tension in the rope is 500 pounds. But what we want to know is what is the resultant of those two tensions working together, T1 and T2. So if we uh, remove the clutter, rotate it around so we get some good uh, uh, square triangles, uh, we can come up with the diagram that you see here. Uh, we know that the total angle is 60 degrees. If we were to break it into two right triangles, it's 30 degrees each uh, there at the, that top apex. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to identify two different ways to solve this resultant to figure out what is the resultant created by the 60 degree angle. The first way we're going to do it is by separating these two right triangles, the yellow and blue triangle out, identifying those two resultants and adding them together. The second way we're going to do it is using parallelograms. And parallelograms is the next leap beyond right triangle trigonometry. Uh, but I, I think, I, and I know that some of our rescuers out there understand parallelograms. And uh, I want people to have an awareness and, under, of an, and an understanding that, that there's a way to determine that that's pretty handy. So our first method will be to break these two um, triangles apart and in the two different components. And uh, we are going to solve <clears throat> for resultant one and resultant two. And those two resultants added together give us the total resultant applied to that pulley in that change of direction. So um, if we did the math on the yellow triangle and ran it through, 
uh, we would come out to a resultant of 433 pounds. So our pink side is our known, that is our originating vector. And uh, it has a value of 500 pounds. We could vector analysis and just compare it. We know it's just slightly less, or we can run the math out and identify that it's 433 pounds. Same thing occurs on the tr uh, triangle on the right. We add those two together, and we can then identify that our resultant of this 60 degree angle is 866 pounds. So the anchors that support this pulley, uh, the carabiners, all of that have to support 866 pounds. So um, we know that, great. Uh, we, we just solved it using uh, two right triangles. Well, now let's solve it with parallelograms. Uh, the limitation of using right triangles to solve this problem is that those two right triangles have to be symmetrical. Um, it, it can't be non-symmetrical. Uh, they have to be symmetrical. The advantage to using parallelograms to solve this problem is if you get forces that aren't symmetrical, you can still solve the problem. Uh, you can't do that using right triangles. So the way you use uh, parallelograms to solve this problem is uh, you have your two known quantities, which is T1 and T2, your two tensions from the rope. Uh, one's going into the pulley, the other one's coming out of the pulley. And we will go to the tip of uh, the opposite vector, and we will draw a parallel line with itself uh, out to the midpoint. Uh, we do that for both of them there and we come up with a triangle, which is called a parallelogram. Uh, the two yellow triangles that you see depicted in this diagram are the same, and the two blue triangles are the same. So let's remove some of this clutter so that we can do our vector analysis. Instead of doing the math, we're just going to use a vector analysis, so you don't even have to use math. So here we remove the clutter and we've taken this resultant, the length of that blue line is its magnitude. And uh, we've pulled it off to the right there so that it's kind of isolated and we can see it by itself. And we've taken the magnitude of our pink vector, which is our known originating vector quantity, which is 500 pounds. And uh, we've created a scale and we've put that scale right next to our resultant and we've measured it out. But just immediately looking at it, we can tell that it's almost twice the length. And so we know that it's significantly more than the originating vector. And if we were to do our vector analysis, we can see that uh, it is very close to 875. So in our uh, practical or in our mathematical analysis, I should say, we got 866 uh, pounds of force. And if we look at our vector analysis, we're right in that 865, 866 range by comparing the, uh, the length of our originating vector, our pink vector, uh, with the resultant. So by understanding parallelograms uh, and using our change of direction example, uh, we could draw parallelograms for changes of directions at 30, 60, 90, 120, any angle you wanted to. And you could uh, determine the resulting force from those angles. In the rope uh, tech, we teach people to try to memorize those numbers. And I, I would prefer people memorize at least 90, 120, and 150 and have those in your back pocket so you know what they are. Uh, and then this is the math that supports that and, and backs that why, backs up that how with a why. So there are many, many more examples where we might, where we may find right triangles and rescue. I encourage you to keep your eye out for them. When you see them, uh, identify the magnitude of the originating vector, identify the components and use that, the identification of that to uh, perform a more efficient and safe operation. <clears throat> so I want to leave you with a challenge. I told you I was going to give you a trench rescue example. Well, I'm not going to give you the answer to this one. 
I want you to figure it out. Use the things that you've learned in the past 45 minutes to an hour to solve this problem. So here are the conditions. You're setting a corner shore. So we're, we're doing an L-shaped trench. You're setting a, cor a corner shore in a trench. You place your thrust block. You place your corner block. And you prepare to, to pressurize that strut into the corner. As you do that, you remember that Mitzik said to only shoot corner struts 50% of the pressure that your perpendicular struts are pressurized at. Okay, well, uh, our normal pressure is 200 PSI in a Paratech strut. Well, our corner struts then need to be shot at 100 PSI for Paratech struts. So how much does that 100 PSI result in in a force well our acme gray struts are two and a half inches in diameter um, which has a, a surface area of 4.9 inches so 100 psi times 4.9 square inches uh, gives us uh, uh, 490 pounds of force all right so now i know that that corner shore is going to apply a 490 pound force at an angle so my question to you is that as that strut applies that 490 pound force onto that thrust block, how much of that force is driven into the trench wall and how much of it wants to kick that uh, thrust block out? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of help. Here I've, I've diagrammed it out for you already. And uh, as we uh, said early in the presentation, uh, to do it mathematically, you need two knowns. And here we know that the strut has a force value of 490 pounds. And I've given you the angles on the screen. <clears throat> so I would ask that you share your answers uh, via text, uh, diagram your answer, text it to the number on the screen. Uh, bonus points if it's on grid paper and the scale. Um, once I get your answer, I will uh, send you back a couple of diagrams of what I got for the answer, and we can compare notes. So I hope that uh, this presentation has been at least slightly helpful. Hopefully it's uh, grown your knowledge of rescue uh, at least a little bit. And uh, if, you, if I could do anything for you, Call me at the number on the screen, and I wish you all well.